So thank you very much for being here today. Um, I hope you will find this presentation interesting. Um, music is an inseparable part of our daily lives. And um, I don't think there is anyone in the world um, who will say he or she doesn't like music or can live without music. So, but most of the time um, we take it for granted. We have um, musical uh, devices. We have, um, especially in the uh, internet era, uh, we have music everywhere. We are surrounded by uh, millions of uh, music um, channels and uh, media and, and it's, it's part of our lives. We watch TV, um, you have commercials um, that come with music, you watch um, a movie, uh, it comes with music. So um, we utilize music in every way we can. Um, the interest in this talk uh, came um, when I um, met uh, this, this gentleman uh, by the name um, Werner Bachmann uh, during mid 1990s. Um, he um, opened a different uh, pathway for me to look into uh, musical uh, history. Uh, so I'm, the, the first part of this um, talk is dedicated to uh, Mr. Bachmann. And then um, I added my own information uh, to um, the early music uh, title. And then we will talk about um, music from ancient coins. So this is, um, this is my country. I, I come from uh, Turkey, um, specifically uh, from this area. Um, Adana is my hometown. So uh, early on, I was exposed to um, ancient cultures and um, civilizations, um, sites. I visited quite many of these sites. Um, when, when you uh, look at um, these sites, you will see the uh, traces of early settlement and um, domestication and uh, farming practices. Um, the whole area, uh, is the northern part of the Fertile Crescent uh, in Mesopotamia and um, southern um, Anatolia, central and southern uh, Anatolia. Um, and, and they finally um, discovered this site called Göbekli Tepe. I'm sure quite many of you um, have heard of it and, and watched something about it. Um, predominantly, um, a religious um, site. Uh, apparently, they haven't discovered any um, uh, any settlement um, in this in this site. Um, mind you, they have only um, uh, excavated um, a small chunk of the the whole um, area, so they might come across um, something substantial in that area, but. Um, one of the most interesting um, items that um, was found uh, in Nevali Chori, uh, in this area, um, in modern Shanlurfa, where Quebec de Tepe is also located, is this uh, Neolithic um, uh, ball. Um, it is car carved out of um, stone. Uh, but you always see two dancing figures, and there is a kind of animal um, between them. And I just, um, it just inspired me to um, show you this, this uh, video.
is the first. So as you see, um, this is um, a, a modern um, time um, wedding ceremony um, taking place in a small village in um, southern um, Turkey. And these are all village people. And um, I know by experience and knowledge, um, uh, having been born uh, there and lived there for more than 45 years, none of these people are musicians, none of these people are, um, is um, a, a musician or none of them is a dancer. Um, these people learn um, these dances um, as they grow um, in their villages. And um, you can see they are not professionals, but yet they, there is a certain attempt by all of them to, um, uh, to move um, in, 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 in a harmonious way. And they are all trying to follow one another. Usually um, the, this, this group becomes really um, big. Um, almost all males in that village um, are expected to uh, join the group. And uh, older people lead the way uh, because they know uh, the movements better than um, the younger ones. And they all look at each other's feet. They try to follow one another. And, um, and I thought um, uh, of uh, this, this ball with um, two dancing figures. Um, and I said, you know, uh, I'm not saying these people are performing the dances of the Neolithic period. But I'm saying that uh, this is um, an oral uh, and mutual culture that they carry on. And, um, and these people are not professional um, uh, musicians or dancers. And one other thing that I would like to emphasize here is the, um, uh, the loudness of uh, the music. Basically, they have two instruments, um, a drum and um, a, a, a blow whistle in, um, instrument called uh, zurna. And um, they do not use any amplifiers. They don't need any amplifiers. They are the original loud uh, thundering, especially when you are um, next to that drum and when it is played, you have to protect your ears. Uh, you know, they are very, very loud. So they were designed to be played in open areas and um, where the sound can freely um, um, uh, go about and around and, and, and everyone can hear them. However, uh, when we um, study um, music history, we have to look at the issue um, from two different perspectives. One is um, sound producing instruments and the other one is musical instruments. Um, music didn't start as music as we know it uh, today, of course. Um, people um, created sound producing instruments first. And this is where uh, my interaction with um, Dr. Werner Bachmann started uh, in um, 1994, I believe. He was um, researching uh, for this work um, called Early Sound Producing Instruments, um, IQ Musicology. And it was published in the New Grove Dictionary of Music and Musicians, second edition, uh, volume one. Um, he wrote a, a letter to the um, Adana Museum where um, I am a registered um, collector and I was with the uh, museum director one day and he showed me his uh, letter and they didn't speak English and he said uh, what does this person um, ask for and I said well he, um, um, he wants to know if you have such and such um, items in the collection and he would like to see and the director of the museum said, well, it's up to you. If you want to answer, go ahead and answer. He said, I'm not, I don't represent the museum. He says, yeah, okay, well, we don't speak English. Um, so um, I contacted him and he was, um, he was so happy. He, um, 
telephoned me from Germany at that time and we spoke on the phone and he came to Turkey and then um, I got involved in his uh, research and um, he was in his uh, mid seventies at that time. And, um, and um, he was not able to travel um, everywhere. So uh, he trained me um, and then uh, we went, we visited quite a few museums together and then uh, he taught me how to uh, look at um, the material and how to distinguish um, musical um, uh, material from other uh, material. And then um, I traveled um, to uh, several museums uh, in Turkey uh, to do research on his behalf. So um, this is when I visited him in 2011 uh, in his uh, house in Leipzig uh, with his wife, Eleanor. Unfortunately, he passed away the next day. So it was good that I um, visited him um, uh, in 2011. Um, these are uh, Mr. Bachmann's uh, findings now. Um, this is a pre-pottery and uh, Neolithic, um, probably um, 8,000 uh, uh, BC uh, phalange whistle uh, from Chayunu, uh, again from the same, the northern part of the um, uh, Fertile Crescent. Um, and it is a whistle. Um, he blew it. Uh, it has a very strong uh, sound. Uh, I know the sound of it. I heard it, but uh, we didn't have any cell phones at the time to record it, unfortunately. Uh, and he believed that they were used to give signals to keep contact with other hunters and or for ritual purposes. But he was not really adamant on the ritual um, uh, purpose. He thought it was mostly uh, to give signals and, and to keep contact with um, other hunters at that time, uh, because they were still hunter gatherers as well as um, uh, newly settled um, people. And um, this is a, a, another um, whistle, uh, but in, in a different uh, form um, with different material, uh, a tubular uh, whistle from Aslan Tepe Malatya. And um, I, I found this um, item, we didn't expect to have this, but when I visited the museum, um, coincidentally, um, I saw it and I took a picture and sent it to him and he was very excited to see that. It's from the second millennium BC, not as um, old as the previous one, but, um, but it's a whistle, it's not a, a flute or, um, or anything. Um, if they did music with these instruments, um, uh, Dr. Bachman doubted, uh, but um, they were used for um, signaling uh, purposes, he thought. I think um, these are the, uh, the uh, longest lasting uh, sound producing instruments. I remember um, playing, making my own bull roars when I was a little kid. And I'm sure quite many of you um, uh, must have um, used these, uh, but um, they are from the um, Paleolithic and Neolithic uh, periods. Um, they're like pendants. Um, uh, and you just um, tie a string uh, to it and then um, you swing it around um, your body over your head and um, they make interesting uh, sounds. And then we have um, buzz, um, aerophone. And uh, I remember uh, making this myself um, as um, kids uh, in the street. We, uh, we made our own when, and, and we played these. Uh, when we were little. Yeah, this is um, a drawing uh, by Dr. Bachmann. And this is the pods. Scrapers um, are um, really interesting. Uh, I didn't expect um, to uh, see such a sound producing instrument. Um, and um, Dr. Bachmann um, uh, 
worked really hard to uh, prove that these are um, sound producing um, bones. Uh, he made his own um, copy uh, from, uh, I think from a cattle um, bone and, and he demonstrated that in Germany and people um, accepted his uh, thesis that um, uh, they were um, sound producing uh, instruments. The rattles um, are of course um, still um, used today, uh, but these are uh, from the Bronze Age, um, Anatolia, um, mostly made of clay with um, little sound holes um, to the, uh, the bodies. Um, very excitingly, um, we discovered these two rattles in the Adana Museum, the, uh, the city that I come from. And uh, when you hold it in your hand and when you um, uh, shake it, you can hear the, the stones uh, in them. There are at least two stones, if not three. Uh, and when you um, shake it in your hand, they rattle and you can hear that. It's the, the, the same idea. And, um, and obviously um, it had a handle like this, just like this one. And uh, for children to hold in their hands, babies maybe, uh, to hold in their hands, if not their parents, to, um, uh, to charm them and um, to give them comfort. And um, Mr. Bachman also believed that they were, they might have been used um, for ritual purposes, but, um, but it, they, they, they seemed more like a children, um, children's rattle than um, a religious uh, musical object. Then comes um, the drum. Um, they come in uh, many different shapes, um, cylindrical, tubular, and barrel shaped. Um, some of them are single-headed, some of them are double-sided. Uh, um, the upper end is covered with uh, drum skin, usually glued or laced um, in ancient times. Um, in Turkey, they are still used. In the Middle East, they are still used. In Turkey, they are called uh, darbuka or dumbelek. Um, um, when we went to um, uh, the museums in Turkey, um, many of them uh, were uh, um, identified as um, stools. Um, they thought that you would have a big uh, tray of food and you would bring it to uh, the dining hall and uh, put on top of um, these uh, things to, uh, uh, to use them as a stool. But um, Dr. Bachman uh, showed what to look at and how to distinguish um, a, a drum from a stool. In fact, all the similar items that we found in museums uh, proved to be uh, um, drums uh, or tarbuka um, with the Turkish name. And um, so there was a lot of work for museum people to re-identify and uh, relabel those um, artifacts. Sistrum um, is uh, again from the Bronze Age, if not earlier. Of course, we're only talking about Anatolia here. We're not talking about um, Mesopotamia in, in, in general and, and Egypt and in all the other um, cultures that you might have um, similar instruments. Um, this one is um, in the um, Metropolitan Museum of Art, together with another one um, excavated from the same site, uh, Horostepe, in uh, northeastern um, Anatolia. And, uh, and these are, again, from the same um, uh, excavation site, but they are located in the Anatolian Civilizations Museum um, at Ankara. And also this one is uh, from the same museum. However, um, this is a, a, a replica of a Hittite grave um, reconstructed at the Chorum Museum. You can see the same type of systems uh, together with the, um, uh, the burial uh, items. Um, 
so they were uh, produced, almost mass produced. They are all cast, of course. Um, and they were um, a significant part of um, rituals. I can say that these were um, instruments that were used in religious um, ceremonies. Um, stamped symbols uh, were also very um, common objects that we found in um, Turkish museums. And uh, this is a modern one that you wear um, around your fingers in each hand. Um, so you use usually four of them, uh, two in each hand uh, to clap to one another. And this is um, an interesting photo to show how they are used. Um, then you have um, objects uh, that demonstrate musical scenes. And, and this one is uh, an extraordinary uh, piece that I, um, uh, I marvel every time I look at it. Um, this was found at Inandak uh, site um, in, in Chankara in central Anatolia from the 16th century BC, uh, the old Hittite kingdom. Um, you have lyre, lute, harp, tambourine, and cymbal players, as well as dancers and acrobats around it. Um, the first string instruments um, in Anatolia um, appear during this time in the Bronze Age. Um, the most significant aspect of this um, was is that it depicts a sacred marriage ceremony. And um, many um, ancient historians believe that this is the time uh, when human civilization, at least the Western civilization or Mesopotamian civilization switched from mother goddess to uh, a male god uh, believing system. Uh, previously, um, you see mostly uh, mother goddess depictions. And this one is from, from Chatalhuic from um, 7000 BC. Um, but this is the first time you have this um, ceremonial marriage depicted on um, 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 on a big vessel. And this is a drawing of all the figures. And you see here a huge um, lyre. And I found um, a video, uh, uh, which I think you will find interesting to um, watch. Um, this is music by um, this gentleman, Chaatai Akyol. Um, I found it on YouTube and um, obviously he um, re um, reconstructed um, the, the instrument that he saw uh, on these uh, he typed um, uh, material and he composed music for, uh, for those instruments, of course. Um, again, I, I'm not suggesting that uh, the Hittite music sounded like this, but um, 
this is an interesting uh, demonstration of um, what that kind of instrument sounded um, 3,000, 4,000 years ago. Another aspect of this um, was, is um, this scene. Um, this is the um, opening, uh, the bridal whale uh, scene. Um, in in um, modern societies, um, uh, brides wear usually um, uh, a whale. And in, in ceremonies, uh, the bridegroom is expected to open it. Um, and before opening it, you're supposed to give a gift to uh, the bride. And this is incredibly demonstrating that tradition. Um, it turned into a ring in modern times, uh, but in the past, um, the ring wedding band uh, practice was not known. And um, you were supposed to either give some money, well, uh, during those times, money well, had not, or coin, coins were not invented. Um, so you were supposed to give something valuable. And um, later on, uh, it turned into um, a ring, um, sometimes gold, sometimes um, um, a, a different metal, uh, precious metal um, ring. But as you see, the tradition goes back to uh, 3,000, 4,000 years uh, before our time. Sorry about that. And uh, okay. Now we um, we have similar uh, vases found in um, different places from uh, about the same period with musical scenes on them. So it was not um, indigenous to um, a, a certain uh, uh, site, but in other sites you see them. And here um, you also see a bull leaping dance, uh, much earlier from uh, um, those that you see in, uh, in Crete and, and or in um, um, Southern Greece. And Uh, another uh, example uh, from the same site. This is uh, the site called Hussein Dede. Um, and you have uh, lute players, or we call them saz in Turkey, and um, a lyre player and a tambourine player. Uh, and it goes uh, around it. This is supposed to work like this, yes. Yes, so I think you saw it all. Then um, comes the, uh, the new Hittite period. This is um, 7th, 8th century uh, BC. You have uh, drum players. Um, they are called Bender uh, in Turkey uh, from uh, southeastern Turkey. And this is a neo Hittite relief uh, from Karkamish, Gaziantep, Turkey two people are playing a big uh, drum. This is a one-sided drum uh, played uh, with, the, uh, with, with hands. And um, they come in uh, many different sizes, as you see, smaller sizes. Um, they're going to be tambourine later on, um, but actually they were small drums, as you see. So this is Zinjirli. Again, um, uh, two different sites but the same period and you have musicians. And as you see, they have different types of lyres um, during that time. And this is uh, the uh, instrument that is still in use in Turkey. And I have a short video for you uh, to hear how it sounds, if I believe.
This is um, poetry from the uh, 16th century, Central Anatolia, and it survived in um, oral tradition. And um, and this this um, group uh, performed uh, it with more than 100 performers, um, according to the information on the YouTube channel. Um, I think they did a very impressive job uh, demonstrating. Uh, uh, the idea. Um, on the same um, freeze, uh, the heat tide freeze, you see someone uh, blowing um, a horn here. And um, I couldn't find anything in the Turkish tradition. I knew um, it is not being used in Anatolia uh, now, but um, it, it was used um, in the past. And if you go to this um, YouTube uh, link, you will find someone uh, testing several different um, types of horns and uh, with, with their different sounds. Very, very interesting. Then comes um, the, the suds. Uh, in Western tradition, um, they are usually called um, the lute. Um, uh, with long neck, uh, with a wooden sound box, uh, sometimes uh, wasted um, um, sound box, just like this one, and sometimes with um, a rectangular or oval um, sound box. These are all small ones, but in the modern versions are um, quite um, uh, larger than, uh, than those. And here you also see uh, the double flute or double aulos um, appearing uh, in Anatolia. There are depictions of double aulos from earlier times, but I just um, wanted to show you this one. And interestingly, you have a dancer here. And then there is another figure, uh, most probably carrying another sound uh, producing uh, instrument here. Now. I didn't want to make this um, too complicated and I didn't add it, but in Turkey, um, in the past, they used wooden spoons, uh, the carved spoons uh, from wood. And uh, there is um, a folk dance that is played with uh, clapping uh, wooden spoons to one another. So just like um, uh, clappers, um, you have you hold two spoons in your hand, and as you play, you uh, uh, you um, as you dance, um, you rock them, and they make some interesting sounds. So probably this um, smaller figure, um, apparently um, lower in the status uh, than uh, the uh, aulus player and the lute player, and even the dancer playing. Uh, spoons. And here is another uh, depiction of the um, so-called lute player. Uh, this is from Zinjirli, again, uh, a, a different side. And I found this one uh, in the um, Adana Museum, a pottery vessel um, in the shape of a lute player. He's, um, his instrument is in his hand here. And his mouth is open. Um, and obviously, um, he is singing. And I have something to show you. This is um, uh, a contemporary musician. He passed away a couple of years ago, unfortunately. But um, he comes from this oral tradition, too. Um, he learned how to play the saws from his father. His father was a very famous uh, folk singer um, who passed away in the um, 
early 70s, I believe. And then um, he learned the tr tradition from his father. He um, never went to school. He never had a music teacher of his own. And everything he learned, uh, he learned from his father. And here is a, a short video of him performing. <laughs> Two things to um, to pay attention to uh, here. Um, he's a solo performer. Uh, he only has his saws to perform. He doesn't have any other uh, musical instrument to accompany him. And the only accompaniment he has is his voice, of course. And um, as I said, uh, the, the song is so famous. Uh, as soon as he started to um, sing, people started to uh, clap. So uh, it was. Uh, a well-received um, prelude um, to this uh, folk song. And also the, uh, the interesting uh, thing is that he doesn't really um, starts playing and then singing. He has a long prelude to his song. So that's also a, an old tradition um, that we are used to seeing in operas um, right now. Um, so the, the tr tradition uh, being so um, old and practiced uh, in modern times is fascinating, I believe. Um, we saw uh, examples of uh, liar, um, liars in the Hittite period, but this one um, is from Mesopotamia, um, the famous liar of uh, the Ur um, civilization. Um, about the same at times, or a little earlier than the uh, old Hittite period. And I have this uh, video to share with you. Thank you. 
I said before, this is a modern um, improvisation of this instrument. It's a, a replica instrument, but it's quite loud. It's um, amazingly loud, I believe. Um, they were, we understand, they were widely used in um, ceremonies uh, in ancient times. This is the uh, the feast of um, King Asatiwaka uh, from the uh, Neo Hittite period. Uh, 8th, 7th century uh, BC. Um, and here you see the king um, is enthroned. Um, there is an attendant be uh, behind him. Uh, it's a um, hot climate um, area. Uh, so it's really hot. So someone is um, uh, helping him with that. And um, also people carry food um, to the king. And in the lower, uh, section you see um, musicians uh, coming and then there is an, a full um, sacrifice scene, uh, a, a complete scene for uh, a feast. And of course um, you have musicians uh, and dancers. You see. Now, a, a little music uh, from the uh, Egyptian um, uh, civilization. Um, when they excavated the, um, the, the uh, tomb of um, Tutankhamun, of course, um, the focus was on the, uh, uh, the, uh, the tomb and the, the golden mask. And when you talk about uh, Tutankhamun, uh, people will only remember um, those sites. But they also found um, some uh, musical instruments. And um, they were um, really interesting. And uh, in 1939, uh, BBC Radio went to um, Egypt and made a recording. And um, here I have the sound of, from that recording. And now the two trumpets will be blown by bandsman James Tapper, who is here by permission of the colonel and officers of the 11th Prince Albert's own Hussars. I must explain that neither trumpet is easy to sound, and this is particularly true of the copper instrument. The silver one will be heard. The trumpets of the pharaoh Tutankhamun. Lord of the crowns, King of the South and North, Son of Bray. What? to this video, um, but you're most welcome to go um, on YouTube and watch the rest uh, if you like. Um, fortunately, um, the silver uh, trumpet was shattered um, right after this, uh, this performance. Um, they restored it, uh, but um, they uh, haven't dared to play them again since, um, since that, that time. Okay, now, um, it's time to talk about uh, music from ancient coins. Uh, the lyre, um, as we uh, saw, um, was known um, much uh, before uh, the coins were invented. But um, as soon as uh, the coins uh, became um, a common medium of exchange, um, we start to see musical instruments in connection with um, religion uh, on coins. And um, here is a coin from Karya, 
uh, from the Kalimna uh, island. On the obverse is the head of a warrior, and on the reverse is a lyre with seven strings with uh, an incus um, area around it. Um, we all know that um, a lyre is a symbol, one of the attributes of Apollo. So what we see here is not a musical instrument, actually. It is, um, it is a symbol of uh, Apollo. So we understand that uh, the uh, belief of Apollo was prevalent um, uh, at this location. And, and you see the, um, the, um, a satire, a, a new youth, maybe, um, on a trantum coin. Um, holding flower in one hand and a lyre under his arm. Um, again, uh, the distance uh, between the two um, cities uh, is um, staggering, but the belief was carried on from one place to another. So this also um, tells us about the um, uh, belief of the god Apollo. Apollo, the god of music and fine arts, uh, among other uh, virtues. Um, here is a restored um, Greek lyre uh, with an original um, tortoise shell um, located in the British Museum right now. And I have a modern Greek lyre player for you to play um, his instrument. Again, if you go to um, this YouTube link that I have here, um, you can find his complete uh, performance of this type of liar, and you will also find um, other uh, types of um, liars um, that uh, were uh, imitated from um, ancient times. And you can see the distinction between uh, the, um, the sound uh, of um, each instrument. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, this um, I found um, on, on YouTube again. You will find this video uh, very interesting. I will show you only a, a small excerpt uh, from this, but I will encourage you to go and watch the whole video. But you will find this interesting, I believe. <laughs> This is a sound that hasn't been heard for 2,000 years. This is ancient Greek music, as we think it was actually sung around 400 BC. I'm an associate professor of classics at Oxford University, and for the last five years, I've been concentrating on reconstructing the sounds of ancient Greek music. We're rehearsing in Jesus College Chapel for a concert that we're going to be putting on later in the Ashmolean Museum. The singers in the choir are scholars of ancient music and they're going to be accompanied by replicas of original instruments that were used in ancient Greece. What we call Greek poetry is mainly words that were intended to be sung, very often with the accompaniment of instruments. So the Greek poetry of the ancient world, this was all sung to music. People think the music is lost, I don't believe it is. We have the rhythms, we have the instruments, and we have the melodies. Put that together and you have the music. Okay. So uh, in, in general, um, I, I think we can uh, say the same thing for all music. It's not only um, Greek music um, that um, he mentions here. And, uh, but it's really interesting to hear the sound of the double alos here. I have uh, now, um, instruments on coins, um, uh, the kitara um, with um, 
wooden sound box uh, here. And um, in uh, their demonstration, they use um, a guitar too, which I will show you um, in, a, in a moment. Uh, again, this is um, a symbolism um, that we see on the reverse of these coins um, from Macedon, Chalcidian uh, League, Olympos. Uh, on the overs is the head of Apollo, and on the reverse is um, his uh, instrument. And here uh, we have, this is a coin from Sinope, uh, from Northern Black Sea region in Anatolia. Um, the modern uh, city is also called Sinop now. Uh, on the overs is the head of uh, a nymph, and on the reverse is Apollo sitting on Amphilos and holding guitar and plectrum uh, uh, in his hand. Um, th this is um, a wall painting from Pompeii. Um, many um, want to uh, believe that it is a depiction of Nero, but um, I don't believe it's, it's, it's Nero because um, uh, uh, Nero was not a popular uh, a person um, when um, Pompey uh, had seen its its last days, uh, but it's most likely intended um, to be Apollo. And here is also um, uh, Black Was depiction of Apollo Kitareudos uh, playing his guitar. So here is the guitar player. I think they found uh, the perfect spot uh, to demonstrate this musical piece with this ancient instrument. Um, he sings in Greek, uh, so that's that's remarkable. Um, so I would encourage you to um, go online and uh, uh, listen to the whole um, presentation. Of course, um, you, uh, as the, um, the musicologist uh, explained in the short video, a couple uh, slides before this one, uh, you, uh, you have to have someone to uh, compose um, poetry, uh, write poetry, and then you have to have some musicians to um, accompany uh, the performance of that poetry. Uh, here is a coin from Colophon in um, Ionia, uh, Western Anatolia. On the obverse is Homer, um, seated, holding scroll, um, right hand under chin. So he's writing, uh, he's thinking, and he says, oh, what should I write? And oh, yes, yeah, this is what um, uh, Achilles did. And oh, yeah, let's continue with this uh, idea. And on the reverse, you have Apollo, Kitareodus, holding guitar and lecture. It just tells us that um, here is the playwright and here is um, how it is performed. And um, Strabo, this is a coin from um, Smyrna, uh, Izmir. And as you know, um, quite many cities um, claim that um, Homer was from their town and uh, Smyrna is uh, one of them. Um, this is um, a, a silver coin uh, from the first century BC. On the obverse is Apollo, and on the reverse is Homer um, seated holding scroll, and he has a scepter um, behind. Um, Strabo says that there is also a library in the Homereum, 
a quadrangular portico containing the shrine and wooden statue of Homer in Smyrna. So here is um, a, a continuation uh, from um, the same. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this unique event. Essentially, we classicists study poetry and all this poetry was composed with music. When Homer was composing the Iliad and the Odyssey, he composed with the four-stringed lyre. One can reconstruct four notes, which we think were probably the basis of Homeric music. This is the earliest music that we think we can reconstruct, the music of Homer from around 700 BC. And Stefan Hagel is taking the four notes that are at the basis of ancient Homeric music and improvising based on the Homeric text. What Stefan has reproduced is a simple and fairly repetitive melody. You can hear the underlying metrical, rhythmical dactyl, the da, 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 da. And you hear the melody, and at the end of each line, a kind of instrumental flourish just on the strings of the kithra. Very interesting. Um, you have to have people um, to uh, write poetry and then uh, uh, recite them. And this is a very interesting coin uh, from uh, Fermia Himarenses. Um, third century BC, Sicily. Um, and it is believed that the depiction belongs to um, Stesikoros, um, lived um, much before this coin was uh, struck. The poet uh, standing wearing humation, long stuff leaning against shoulder. He writes poem by holding uh, a wax tablet and using a stylus. Um, it is believed that he is the founder of the Greek choral um, lyric poetry. His real name is Theseus. So um, Stesikoros means master of choirs. As you see, the name is related. Um, Sabo is um, known to be uh, one of the earliest female uh, poets. Um, Many people would like to say the first female poet, but I believe there were quite many other uh, female po uh, poets uh, in ancient times. Um, and this is a, an interesting coin um, struck by Julia Procolo, um, uh, one of the patrons of the city of Mytilene in uh, Lesbos. Uh, on the reverse is a female uh, figure seated uh, playing the lyre, and it is identified as Sappho. And in this one, uh, we have a male figure um, seated with uh, seated um, on a chair with uh, a back, um, and it is um, identified as Anacreon uh, of Pios. Um, well known for his drinking songs and, uh, and hymns. Uh, this is a coin from Pios uh, in uh, Ionia. Uh, on the others is uh, Poseidon, uh, a dolphin around uh, trident here. And on the reverse is Anacreon um, uh, reciting poetry, playing his lyre. And here is um, a similar uh, presentation here, uh, from the same video. Oops. We do have documents with melodic notation, notation that was devised around the 5th century BC, including this wonderful stone from Delphi, which has a paean, which is a hymn of praise in honor of Apollo. And on the stone, we have the words of the text that was sung and above the text, we have these little symbols 
which is the vocal notation, which tells us the precise melodic notes to which those words were sung. Now, there are some gaps, and I have filled in those gaps using only the notes that are available to us from the rest of the stone. is very interesting. Um, so where uh, did these people um, uh, present their performances in um, theaters? Um, not necessarily all the time in theaters. Theaters were um, huge undertakings uh, for any city in ancient times, uh, but they were very important for a city to um, uh, to qualify to be called a city. You have to have a nymphaeum, uh, a fountain, uh, a colonnaded street, uh, a bulletarian, um, a, a city hall, uh, and a temple, of course. And you have to have um, a theater. Um, most of the time, these theaters were not only um, uh, for uh, theatrical plays or musical plays, but uh, there were multi-purpose um, buildings. Uh, most um, city uh, meetings, discussions were held in these uh, theaters as well. Um, and, and here is a very, very rare coin um, that uh, belongs to the third century AD um, by the city of Athens. Uh, on the reverse is, um, th there are apparently a couple uh, versions. I found these online. Um, this one shows the Acropolis um, over um, uh, the, the theater uh, area. And this one shows the complete um, uh, rows or the second row uh, of the theater. And you can see how the theater um, the layout of the theater here. Marcius uh, is known uh, to be the champion of the owls and um, the city of um, Apamea in Phrygia uh, predominantly uses uh, the depictions of Marcius on the reverses of these coins. Um, and most of the time, um, he is standing, uh, and this one is really interesting. Marcius advancing, uh, playing double alles on a meander pattern, uh, and, and this one he is just on um, on a stool. This one um, he's um, uh, on the ground, and this one uh, he's seated. This is really um, interesting. And um, the story is that um, Athena invented uh, this musical instrument, the double owls. Um, of course, it's mythology, as you know. Um, before Athena was invented, this instrument was known. Um, and here uh, is a very, very beautiful um, scene uh, on the reverse um, of a coin from the same city, Apamea. Uh, struck for the Roman Emperor uh, Septimius Severus in the um, um, second uh, century um, AD. Uh, 
here you see the, um, Athena is uh, seated on uh, rocks and head turned to right. Um, the reason why he, she turns her head is there is a pond here uh, and she is trying to uh, see her own reflection in the water. Um, in the background, Marcius hidden behind rocks and um, just uh, observing, watching um, Athena playing. But um, unbeknownst to us, but actually uh, they are standing um, out of the scene, um, Aphrodite and Hera. Uh, they are watching um, uh, Athena and they laugh at her. And they say, oh, you look so um, uh, ugly when you um, puff uh, that instrument. Your cheeks become puffy and you become ugly. So um, Athena simply uh, uh, throws them aside. And um, sure enough, um, this um, Marcius uh, simply uh, picks them up and he starts to play. And he plays it, uh, he becomes um, such a, a master of Aulos uh, that he challenges the god Apollo. That was the mistake of his lifetime. Um, this is a frieze from the um, Athens National Museum from the fourth century BC, uh, showing um, Marcius challenging Apollo. Um, how dare he do that? And um, here is a coin uh, of uh, Maximinus uh, from Tarsus, uh, 235, 238. Um, and as you see, um, Apollo is seated uh, holding his lyre. There is a figure in the middle. We don't know. It is not identified on the coin, but here we um, clearly see that uh, Marcius tied to a tree and uh, flayed alive. This is um, a statue from the Istanbul Archaeology Museum. Uh, I presume that the, the person in the middle is the King Midas uh, of Phrygia. Um, and as you see in this coin, the king is depicted with ass's ear. And uh, when, uh, during the competition, he was chosen to be um, a referee. And um, uh, after, the, um, after hearing the performances of both Apollo and Marcius, the king Midas, um, or Midas, said um, uh, to have said that uh, he thought Marcius's performance was not so bad. And uh, Apollo got angry with him and he gave him uh, uh, um, asses, um, uh, ears, said, uh, what kind of ears do you have? How can you say that uh, his music is better than mine? And that is depicted on a coin of Phokaya uh, in uh, Western Anatolia. Um, there are uh, only a couple of um, ancient um, aulases uh, in museums. This is one uh, um, located in the Louvre. And you can go to this uh, website and um, see the um, complete research uh, about this uh, instrument. And here is a performer um, playing the double aulos. He's improvising and showing the kind of sounds that the two pipes together can make. Notice that the techniques that are used by the pipers is circular breathing, where they're breathing in normally through their nose, they're holding the breath in their cheeks and they're pushing it out, and at the same time they are taking breaths into their nose so that they can make a continuous sound, a bit like bagpipes, but doing it with their own bodies.
He's in beautiful music and extraordinary um, performance, I believe. Then comes uh, the syrinx. Um, it's the instrument of um, the god Pan. And um, he um, watching over um, the shepherds and their flocks. Um, his worship uh, began in Arcadia um, in Greece. Um, he inspired sudden fear in lonely places, panic. Uh, was later known for his music, capable of arousing inspiration, sensuality, or panic, depending on his intentions. Um, here is an interesting um, um, statue group from Pompeii, uh, Pan teaching Daphne how to play his instrument. And sure enough, we see this, um, we see uh, the Pan flute um, on many, many coins. Uh, here is one uh, from Arcadia, where it is believed that his um, uh, mythological story was created. Uh, Pan seated on rocks, torso facing, holding Logobola, uh, syrinx at the base of the um, rock. And, uh, and syrinx was a, a nymph known for her, her chastity. As you know, um, Apollo chases her and she runs, and, and finally, um, when she uh, realizes that um, she's going to get caught, she begs uh, Zeus to turn her into um, uh, reeds. And it is believed that uh, the sound of this instrument actually is singing of, of the nymph syrinx. Organ is also depicted on coins, um, albeit quite lately, not um, in uh, the early uh, periods of the Roman uh, imperial uh, times. Uh, this is a um, contortea um, struck in the name of the emperor Nero. On the reverse is um, uh, two, uh, are two figures standing left and right of an organ with nine pipes. Uh, the uh, person on the left holding a leaf-shaped fan. And um, another example um, is located in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. Uh, just one person um, attending uh, to the instrument. There are quite a few terracotta figures uh, from the uh, first century AD. So the instrument was known a uh, couple hundred years before the depictions that we see on these coins. Um, you can uh, read more about the hydraulic organs um, at this website or on this website. Um, Orpheus charming uh, the animals is um, a well-known scene that um, is depicted on uh, coins. Here is one struck uh, for Antoninus Pius in Alexandria in Egypt. Uh, on the reverse, you see Orpheus seated on rock, playing lyre, charming numerous wild animals around him. And here is a coin from uh, Philippopolis uh, in Trace uh, this time, uh, struck for the young emperor Geta. Um, on the reverse, again, you see, um, oops. Uh, you see um, Orpheus, um, charming. You can you can distinguish the animals. There is um, uh, almost like a crane here, and a dog maybe, uh, birds, and um, a, a deer, and elephant, uh, and even a goat, uh, maybe um, a lion here. Uh, depending on uh, the inspiration of the coin die engraver, you see different animals. Uh, but the, um, the scene is very um, nicely depicted. Conch is a, a natural um, instrument. Um, I guess um, they only did a little work uh, on the mouthpiece to um, sound it. Um, uh, it is mostly seen on the coins of Himera in Sicily. Um, 
on this coin, you have a nude uh, rider um, on gold holding conch in right hand, uh, and he's about to blow it. Um, the same scene, uh, this time uh, the figure being to the left uh, on a silver coin. This is a very, very small um, silver coin. Um, again, this um, nude youth uh, riding uh, a goat um, and about to blow um, a conch. Kibela uh, and the Timpayon um, was a well known um, uh, symbol during the Roman period, uh, even though it was um, known from earlier times. Remember, Kibela um, is uh, a follower of the earlier um, mother goddess. Uh, the figure, um, you can see the uh, similarities. Um, this one is naked, uh, giving birth to a baby, but uh, two uh, lions or panthers uh, on each side. And this one is a Roman um, period um, representation of the same goddess. And we see uh, that exactly uh, depicted on the reverse of this uh, Sestertius um, struck for Diva Faustina, uh, Antoninus, Antoninus Pius's wife. Um, interestingly, um, you have this coin. Uh, struck at Daldis in Lydia for Septimius Severus. This time you have Apollo Mistis seated uh, here, and the goddess uh, Magna Mater, Kibele, is um, sitting uh, across from him, and he's performing for her. Um, this is really interesting. Um, you don't see the goddess here uh, performing, but listening to Apollo. Um, as you know, um, the, the idea uh, of mother goddess uh, was known um, long before um, the magna mater um, idea. And this is um, a representation from the um, sixth century BC uh, from uh, Phrygia. And interestingly, we see um, the goddess here uh, accompanied by two musicians. Um, um, it was thought that the musicians were um, little children uh, at the beginning, but actually um, the reason why they are um, represented so small is because their status was much lower than the goddess. So uh, that's why um, they are depicted small. Uh, we spoke about uh, the sistrum, um, and, and later on, it became uh, a symbol of Isis, uh, of the Egyptian um, goddess. Um, she was honored with a temple um, at Rome. Uh, professional singers, musicians, and dancers, mostly female, would perform at the temple during um, her festivals. Um, the Isis festival was a major celebration uh, in the third and fourth centuries, uh, heralding the arrival of the ships of um, Isis from Alexandria on March 5th. Um, and here we see um, Isis uh, reclining um, um, on a coin, a Sestertius of um, Hadrian from um, Rome mint, but um, with the uh, legend Agyptos. And here is another um, coin um, celebrating uh, the festival. Um, and in this one, on, on the um, reverse, you see um, Isis seated facing, uh, suckling horse, but on the uh, obverse is uh, the draped bust of Isis uh, um, holding the sistrum. Uh, with music and singing comes dance. Um, this is a very uh, interesting coin um, representing um, the god Dionysus in uh, an act of 
Dance. Um, head turned to left, holding Thirsos, his uh, staff, in right hand, and Cantaros uh, um, in left hand, drinking and dancing. Um, these are the types of uh, old Greek dances. And I, um, I, I uh, researched quite a bit. And um, since this figure represents Dionysus, I thought um, the dance he performed would be Dionysiakos. Uh, but I was not able to find anything similar or related to this. Um, there are uh, some YouTube videos showing some old uh, Greek dances, uh, but the one that I found closest to the depiction here is actually um, Zeybekiko, um, uh, also known as Zeybek dance in, in Turkey. But look at this one. Uh, this is, by the way, from 1936. Oops. So um, you see um, the modern day uh, Dionysus and drinking wine and smoking in a tavern. Let's see. I paid the jada telephone. He had your thirsty. The logia to haru. Yet you posit an epole ye, the hasisa, ye supermovest, the berna yet logocracia. If you go on YouTube and, um, and, and search for uh, Greek dance, uh, you can find hundreds of videos um, from modern times. But I intentionally uh, picked up this one from 1936. Actually, um, uh, it was not indicated uh, from which year uh, it was on the YouTube uh, channel. But um, a Greek friend of mine uh, helped me find out um, the year of release of this video. Um, I wanted to uh, pick up something old uh, so that it is, I want to believe that it is not contaminated by modern thinking and modern um, um, invention of um, dances. Um, Zebekiko um, is uh, well known in Greece now and um, you see many people perform that dance uh, and they, uh, act similarly um, to um, this um, modern uh, Dionysus. But I, I, I'm not saying that he was uh, performing uh, what uh, we see on the coin, uh, the Dionysus is doing, but um, it is, there's a great chance that he was um, dancing similarly to um, Dionysus. Um, the next um, dancers um, are the um, Kurets um, or Corebantes. Uh, they were the protectors of the infant Zeus from his murderous father, Kronos. Uh, on this coin, we see two um, Kuretes, um, helmeted and clad in short tunic, holding aloft short swords and shield and dancing. Uh, this is a coin um, struck for um, Gordianus III and his wife Tranquilina uh, in Mesembra, uh, Thrace. And uh, here is um, another coin, um, this time from Trales in uh, Libya, struck for Antoninus Pius. 
Um, but uh, interestingly, we see uh, more figures here. Uh, Adrastea, um, this is the uh, Cretan nymph uh, who was charged by Rhea with nurturing the infant Zeus in secret. Um, and, um, and, and their protectors, um, the three Cretas, uh, helmeted and clad in short sheeton uh, or keeton, each beating his raised shield with sword. Now I have something to reminisce of. Again, this is uh, from 1967, a very old video. Um, let's see what you will think about it. So this is a, a very well-known Turkish uh, sword and shield uh, dance. And, um, um, and, you know, it has been performed for many, many years. This is from Bursa, um, ancient uh, Prusa uh, in Bithynia. Um, there are simply, to me, they are simply dancing just like the uh, Kuretis or Kuretis um, dancing. Very, very interesting. Um, this is an interesting coin uh, from Illyria, uh, from the city of Apollonia, um, the fire dance. Um, you have three nymphs uh, dancing hand in hand around a fire. And the wonderful depiction of an invitation to dance uh, from the city of uh, Plautila in uh, Trace in um, modern Bulgaria, um, coins struck for Caracalla. On the reverse is a um, naked satire inviting Mayanat to dance. There are quite a few uh, depictions, um, uh, versions of this, this coin. I found this. Uh, interesting. And then I have here a, a pen um, depiction um, dancing on the reverse of a bronze coin from Philadelphia in Libya, struck for the Empress Julia Domna. Now, this is the most amazing um, coin depiction um, as far as music is involved, in my view. And when I saw this uh, coin, I was in awe. I just looked at it and looked on and on and on. It's just an incredible scene of a dancer uh, from the fourth century BC, um, uh, Abdera in uh, Trace. Um, and I immediately found this. Um, it's Irina Kalesnikova uh, in Swan Lake um, from the St. Petersburg um, Ballet Theater. Who invented ballet? No comment. <laughs> And now that we're talking about music, we have to mention the, um, the nine muses of Apollo, uh, very meticulously um, depicted on a series of coins um, during the Roman, uh, pure, uh, Roman uh, Republic, um, Roman Re Republican period uh, by uh, the monier Pomponius Musa. Um, you can uh, see all the different muses depicted together with um, Hercules. Um, temple and music um, was um, 
Ur um, depicted on coins. Uh, again, here is a um, um, Roman as uh, struck for um, Domitian or Domitian. Um, on the reverse, we see uh, the emperor standing, libating um, in front of a lighted altar. And then he has two musicians accompanying him. One is playing uh, tabalalos and the other one is uh, playing a um, guitar or a lyre. Um, uh, and apparently um, this is the scene celebrating um, the secular games uh, in his 14th consulate. Um, there are several uh, versions of this scene. Um, this one, uh, when uh, there is um, a sacrificial uh, scene, um, Victimianus here, uh, bringing a goat and a ram to sacrifice. And again, the emperor is accompanied by uh, two musicians. And here is another um, musical libation uh, scene um, from a gold coin of uh, the emperor Septimius Severus. Um, on the reverse, uh, the emperor in um, toga and um, uh, sacrificing over a lighted uh, altar and his um, son, elder son, uh, Caracalla, um, is um, facing him and between them and Aulus player. So uh, these ceremonies apparently uh, were all held uh, with musical um, accompaniment. Um, here is um, uh, a fun uh, piece struck for um, Geta when he was um, uh, only a Caesar, not uh, an Augustus yet. Um, on the obverse uh, is bare head, uh, but on the reverse is the wedding of Bacchus, uh, Dionysus uh, of the Romans, and Ariadne. Uh, both of them are um, seated. Um, there is um, a, a panther in front of them. Um, uh, in back of them is um, Herm, Hermaphrodite. And uh, here is his um, companion, um, Silenus or Silenus. And um, together uh, with a manat in the background. And here we have two musicians, um, double alus player and a um, lyre or a guitar player. And as late as um, the uh, fourth century, um, you uh, see um, the temple music. Um, this is a medallion uh, for Constantius the first. Um, when um, he was um, uh, declared Caesar together with uh, Maximianus during the first uh, Tetrarchy. Uh, again, they are sacrificing um, in front of the temple. Um, there is a bull um, that is going to be sacrificed eventually, and uh, a trumpet player um, is depicted or completes the scene. Um, Speaking of trumpet, um, it, is, um, it is very known in military music. Um, Herodotus um, talking about uh, the Alietes' army says he had inherited the war against Miletus from his father. Therefore, he was launching a campaign and this is what he did to lay siege on the city. He sat on the road when Kor consigned the earth grew up the army was marching to the sound of syrinxes, harps, and flutes, both women's and men's flutes. And here is a coin of Demetrius uh, um from uh, the fourth, third century BC. Uh, on the reverse is Nike lighting a top row of galley blowing um, trumpet and apparently celebrating his victory in the naval battle of Salamis, uh, completely destroying the naval power of the Ptolemaic Egypt. I have um, some videos just to give you a, a little idea about the, um, the instruments uh, uh, of the Roman uh, army. 
uh, coronum uh, is not represented on any um, uh, any coins uh, as far as I uh, could see, but I thought you would find this interesting. Inagmine. Taurus. Fortida. Axi. Axi. Lupu. Also, a short video for the uh, Roman litus, um, another um, kind of trumpet. Um, maybe you will find it interesting too. <laughs> Litus is a common um, coin um, type. We see a lot of uh, coins with litus, but not intended as um, a musical instrument. It is an auger's hoop um, staff uh, that um, is represented on many Roman coins. Uh, so it's a religious symbol, uh, but not as a, a musical instrument. Um, of course, the trumpet uh, is used today uh, in many uh, military um, uh, schools and, and, and uh, in, in military actions. It's, it was a perfect instrument to make a declaration. And here is um, a coin um, struck for the Bar Kokhba War in Judea in um, AD 132 and 135. Two trumpets, but most interestingly, the legend says, for the freedom of Jerusalem. So, making a declaration. Uh, the Carnix, um, a ceremonial Celtic trumpet shaped in the form of a boar's or wolf's head, um, uh, was a very common uh, coin type after um, the victory. Uh, uh, of um, Caesar um, or the um, uh, the gold, um, and here is an interesting uh, cauldron uh, called Undastrup um, cauldron. You see the um, Carnix uh, players, and this um, coin um, struck by the monier uh, Albinus Brutus. And on the obverse is the head of Mars, of course, um, the god of war. And on the reverse, uh, two Gallic trumpets in saltire, an oval shield above, one shield below. Um, they were all spoils of war, um, declaring how they uh, defeated the, uh, the, um, the Gaul uh, army. And here is an interesting um, performance of this instrument. Uh, by John Kenny at the British Museum. <laughs> Again, I have to emphasize the fact that um, these are all, all modern um, uh, improvisations of um, music 
uh, using um, ancient uh, replicas, replicas of ancient uh, instruments. I would encourage you to, to um, go to this link and um, see the, uh, the complete performance. Um, Mr. Kenny um, uh, demonstrates um, quite a few ancient musical instruments uh, during this performance. And I have um, some uh, book recommendations, as I always do, uh, for further reading. Um, you can find all of these books interesting. Um, they are, um, each of them has their own um, way of uh, explaining how music uh, uh, evolved in, um, in ancient times. Um, quite a few of them uh, completely dismiss uh, the ancient origins of music, which I found quite um, um, interesting. Um, but um, as the, uh, the titles um, suggest, it says ancient Greek music, the, the rise of music in the ancient world, East and West. I think this one is a little more interesting than um, um, the um, book of um, Mr. Hegel and uh, music in ancient Greece and Rome um, is interesting because um, it goes into detail um, of musical um, instrument um, development and performance in those um, civilizations. Uh, this is a, a book by um, my friend, um, Mr. Bachman the origins of the bowling. And I have two um, YouTube links for you to go and um, check out and, and enjoy. Thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to um, try to answer your questions now. <laughs>